Hello, and welcome to the Screen Composer Studio, a podcast about the musical storytellers behind some of your favorite films, shows, video games, and more. I'm your host, Adrian Ellis. Every time I chat with Peter Chapman, aka Coins, I hear another amazing story well told. The pivotal moments in his life also connected a narrative full of serendipitous events that have opened windows to let his talent shine through. This multiple Canadian Screen Award nominee started his diverse career producing hip-hop and electronic music and got his breakout gig via the instructor of one of his electives eight years after attending the Ontario College of Art and Design. That show was Durham County, and many more would follow. The sci-fi cult favorite Winona Earp co-scored with Rob Carley, Bomb Girls, HGTV's Leave It to Brian, CBC's hit Working Moms, and many more. He's also been a first call for developers, scoring games such as Guacamelee 1 and 2, Little Big Planet Karting, and Sound Shapes, among others. We talk about how he left cassettes of his music in public bathrooms, the crash course learning of first gigs, his airport layover created Beastie Boys remix that went hyper-viral and ended up being lauded by Maxim, Esquire, People, and Billboard magazine, how he bridged the gap between being an electronic music producer to writing for orchestra, and why he thinks one of the keys to success is being able to take a good punch. If you like what you hear, please consider giving us a rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. It really helps us grow and share the stories of these amazing creators. And now follow me down many unexpected paths with Peter Chapman. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You took a, you took a drink there at the perfect time. I always <laughs> do that right before someone asks a, answers a question. I'm taking a big drink of water. I'm like, oh, all good. All good. Um, so you're a Haligonian. Yeah, that's that's sort of you're an OG Halifax boy. I am. I absolutely am. Is is that? I mean, there's a lot of uh, music obviously associated with the Maritimes. What's your what's your earliest memory of music that had a really profound effect on you? Earliest memory that had a profound effect on me? Oh man, uh, when I was in grade four, I was nine years old. My parents got me a uh, a grading my grading present, which is a thing. I don't know if that's a thing for everybody, like. Anyway, my parents got me tickets to see Run DMC oh, wow. at this tiny little club called the Flamingo. Okay. Um, which, like, everything about this was weird. Like, it was Run DMC in a tiny club. It was all ages, which made no sense. Uh, but yeah, so that was that. I think that was the first time I saw a concert that really blew my mind. Like, that was a, an incredible show. Were you already um, into hip hop at that point? Oh, yeah. Like, grade four, it was all about, like, you know, Bell Biv, Bell Biv DeVoe and Vanilla Ice and, you know, Dream Warriors were blowing up. They actually came the year after. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, in grade four, it was all of it. It was like basically New Kids on the Block and hip hop or hip hop. I mean, a lot of the stuff we were listening to. And was that, not, was that just a fan perspective? Like you just loved the music and it was so exciting to see these people that you knew from the record? Or was it also something where you came back from that experience and went, I think this is something I want to get into? Um, it was a little bit of a fan perspective, the more like something that had a more lasting effect on me in terms of just like weird, like crazy shows was the following year when we saw the Dream Warriors, uh, organized rhyme open for them, who was Tom Green's rap group before he was Tom Green. And I'll never forget this. They came out in coveralls and they just started throwing a loaf of bread at the audience. Like they just had like <laughs> bread and they just started whipping bread at everybody. Okay. And this was like the second concert I'd been to in my life. Right. It was like, what the hell is going on? This is insane. Anyway, that, that, I mean, in terms of leaving a, a, like a, some kind of weird imprint on me, the idea of rappers coming out and throwing bread at the audience was definitely, you know, you weren't going to be seeing vanilla ice or young MC throwing bread at the audience. Right. So that was pretty great. Talk me a bit through like your how you sort of came up in terms of your creative path because I know you ended up studying at OCAD in Toronto so you were and you were in the in design at that point but uh, you know in your in your teens and then into your twenties you're also getting into music and music production well how does that all sort of interlace and how did well, how does the design part of that fit in design was my backup plan uh, which was hilarious I'll uh, I'll get to that but I mean I grew up I did like the classical piano lessons I had a really great classical teacher and then when I hit my teens, Nirvana blows up, and suddenly nobody wants to play piano. Nobody <laughs> wants synthesizers, are the most uncool <laughs> thing in the world. So I get a guitar, and then I start learning guitar. <clears throat> and then I got really, really into surf rock, and I played in an instrumental surf rock band for years, which was really fun. And that was like, I learned a lot in just in that band. I mean, it's all melody. It's all you're just playing. These are like really fast surfy melodies. So I learned a lot about writing and melody that way. Um, and I wanted to go to school for music, but my dad was, he was a musician and he, 
he was he did he toured he was in a band called the mason chapman band and they toured canada back and forth back when you could be kind of like a bar band cover band and make a pretty good living doing it oh, was that he, what it was cover covers it was part covers part originals okay um and they would do like residencies like they would go oh. to like a bar and they'd be there for two weeks and they had they had a crew and they had like a lighting rig and sound guy like it was it was a different world wow and he just got out like he got out and then he landed a gig managing a music store in Halifax called Music Stop and kind of went he went he sold out and went corporate <laughs> and uh but that I think he he knew how hard it was to be in a band and he knew how hard it was to make a living doing music and so he was kind of like please don't go into music like you're like I love that you're in music and everything but um you know, do something else. So I, I wanted to go to OCAD because I wanted to do set design. That was my original plan. Oh, for, so, for theater or for film and TV? For film and TV. And oh, so cool. yeah, yeah. I went into a program called environmental design, uh, thinking that, that I could sort of parlay that into a, a career in, in set design. But I got about halfway through and I was just like, man, what am I doing? Like, I'm supposed to be in music. Like, everything was pointing to music. Every Like, none of it was making sense. So I ended up finishing my degree seven years later, which is a whole other kind of funny story. Um, and ultimately made the, uh, the, the leap towards music. Full mm -hmm. time. Do you look back at that, uh, design education that you got? Is there anything you still draw from and, and, or anything you got from that experience that you still, uh, lean on in terms of the work that you do now? Yeah, uh, time and project management was the big one because we would have these huge projects do. Um, the design the design stream was, unlike the art stream, was my understanding. It was a lot higher pressure, way longer hours, huge projects that you had to get. And you basically had to, like, chop them up and and have a schedule how you're, how you're actually going to pull this off. You know, you had to have, like, all these plans drawn and all these models made and all these conceptual things. And it was, like, it was a ton of work and it was really, really stressful. And that was the most stress I think I'd ever endured in my life up until that point. And I think coming out of that gave me an ability to tackle big projects, which, you know, would be TV and film and video games. Those are huge endeavors that, you, that you've got to tackle. And you just bite off tiny chunks and you schedule how you're going to do it. And I think it also just gave me the confidence that I could handle these ridiculously huge projects and know that just keep pushing and you'll get to the end and, and not get overwhelmed by it. Our, our paths are very similar in so many ways. And I, I too went to uh, post-secondary for fine art. Actually, I wanted to be in graphic design or illustration actually, but I sort of defaulted to that program because everything else is full. Did you have to do uh, crits, like uh, group crits where everyone, you put up your work and everyone gives you feedback and you have to learn how to take notes? Oh yeah, yeah, those <laughs> were the worst. Yeah, you had to get up in front of your class and put your project up and then the teacher would sit there and tell you how awful your project was in front of all of your peers and you had to not turn red and cry. And it was really, really hard. It was like, yeah, that was like, crits were the worst. Those were the most stressful things in the world, which again, I think that, you know, coming now, coming back to the career now where people are constantly evaluating everything you write and often, you know, dumping on it and throwing things out and stuff and just being <laughs> able to take it on the chin. When I was 19, I definitely could not take that stuff on the chin. Like it all right. hurt, all, it, all of us were hurting. It was, it was a class of 30, 20 year olds who were all, you know, secretly crying inside whereas now you know i'm i have no problem throwing cues out you know you just you write it and then you set it free and keep moving there's this sort of interesting um uh, objectivity you have to have about the perspective that you have when you make something you're so close to it and you think it's just amazing like wow look at this thing that didn't exist before and now it's here and all this stuff and all the work and everything and you I think we oftentimes make the mistake thinking that we're going to show something to somebody else and they're going to love it as much as we do, but they just don't have that relationship. Mm -hmm. I've really come to accept like, it is amazing. Like you made something and if you think it's amazing, it is amazing. It doesn't matter that they may not see eye to eye with you. You know, there's that whole thing. There's no disputing matters of taste and you can't get upset. And it's often just like, it's, it's amazing. It's just not amazing for their vision and for what they did. But I mean, the amount of times, like I've written so many cues and I'm like, that was fucking awesome. I'm so stoked for this. And it gets throws, thrown out and you just don't get upset. You're like, well, it was still awesome. Like, I know it was awesome. Right. And I'm, I had a great time writing it and I'm excited. You know, you put it off to the side and maybe you use it for something else or whatever. And also, hopefully, I mean, I like to approach every cue <clears throat> where 
even if it gets thrown out, hopefully I've learned something writing that cue. Hopefully I've, I've gotten something out of it and just gotten a little better at something. So even if it's, if it gets thrown out, it's like, well, I just spent, you know, a few hours practicing my craft and getting paid for it. So whatever, like we'll put it over there. Like I, I've, I think I've gotten pretty good at just not getting, uh, kind of spun out over over notes like that i mean when you get through whole episodes thrown out then you're that's that, then then you get mad but like it's like getting a cue thrown out here and there it happens all the time and you just get used to it yeah what, what would you say that like as you're as you were sort of developing your craft in early days was it um was it sort of split between th- an interest in production as much as it was an interest in music yeah i was like I kind of came at music in a pretty ass backwards way. And I think it's something a lot of people do. And I also think it's not a good way to approach music, but I got, I, tr- I was a gearhead. I got really into the gear. Um, I worked in a store in Kensington market called Paul's boutique. I was surrounded by gear all the time. I also worked at a company called HHB, which does like pro audio equipment surrounded by gear. And there was definitely a point when I was starting, when it was about the gear, you know, it was like, if I had that synth, this, I'd be able to do the thing. Or if I had that cool drum machine, I'd be able to do the thing. And, you know, you acquire all this stuff, and then you slowly start to realize it's like, it's not the gear, it's it's what's in your head. And this is a, you know, it, it's a lesson that I had to learn, and I think a lot of people have to learn, and that it really is not, it is not the gear. But I got, I get, I would get really inspired by the history of the equipment, the history of the synthesizers, and like, who played what on that. I don't think that kind of stuff is particularly helpful in actually making music, it's it's fascinating and it's fun. For me, I felt like in retrospect it was a little bit of a waste of time. There was definitely a turning point when I kind of stopped and I was like, "You're doing this wrong, man!" Like, go to school, you know, <laughs> like read some, like don't literally or literally go to school, whatever. But like, it's you got to start learning how to actually write, learn how to actually make the music, learn how the music's made, um, learn how to actually write write songs, and so. I spent a lot of, like, I put, like, a lot of time on a four-track. Like, that was how I got started. I had a cassette four-track and this little, like, uh, 486 computer with uh, Impulse Tracker on it, which was a really, really fun program. Those who know, know. It was, like, (laughs) super nerdy, but, man, that thing is fun. And that was how I kind of got started in production. It was a lot of, like, electronic hip-hop-based production. Um, And... But then, th- th- again, with that, I was relying a lot on sampling. And then there was this moment when I was like, dude, you got to learn to write your own samples. You can't just, like, sample records and license it in TV shows. That's how you get in trouble. Mm. So I, I ultimately, I got to a point where I had a huge shift. Like, now I'm very cynical about gear. I'm very cynical about all of it. I mean, I'm not super cynical. I mean, I obviously have a lot of synthesizers. <laughs> but I don't, like, I definitely don't think this is important. I think it, it looks awesome behind me in this Zoom call we're doing. But, like... It's not they're, not, they're often not necessarily practical for what we're doing today. Right. I mean, but knowing your music and knowing your approach, there is, there is sort of a history there. Uh, the sound you have now and even the approach that you have seems born of that. Like you wouldn't be doing it the same way had you not had that experience, I don't think. Definitely not. I mean, I definitely came at it from a very techie drum machine synth sampler approach. And I think I still... I still approach that like even now like even when I'm writing you know orchestral cues there's still a part of me that's like the really weird EDM part of my head is still kind of looking at the cue and kind of trying to force these certain sounds and energies into these orchestral cues yeah and I and I think that that reflects you know like right now I'm working on a on a like a kid's cartoon and it's really hectic and chaotic and I'm really pulling from a lot of the the really wild sort of electronic production tricks that I have, but it, a lot of it is through, you know, orchestral palettes. That's so interesting. So you're, you're applying the techniques, not necessarily, uh, directly, but sort of almost in a lateral fashion. Yeah. Like there's like, I sort of have this process, like when I was, when I write like a, an electronic track, I would, I would go through these, these passes where I would go through and first I would, I'd come up with the main hooks and then I'd flush it out and then I would slowly start refining and refining and refining and I'd start mm. putting in all the little fills and all the little weird like things for the other producers to hear and they would all go like, oh what's that weird thing that he just did you know and like the, all the really show-offy stuff yeah and when i write our orchestral cues i do the exact same thing now you know i'll, I'll flesh it out and, and then once i have the cue taking up all the space it needs to then i start going in and doing all the little stuff that i know literally like only the mixer or like 
you know, Rob Carley's assistant is going to hear and they're going to go like, oh, that was cool. But I do it for them and I do it for me. And it make you know, hopefully I'm not wasting too much time doing that. But I do like I, I approach it the same way. That's cool. You have this kind of interesting way. I don't know if I'd call it like um, just the, just in terms of how you sort of developed your career and that that blend of, or that balance between hard work and that sort of resulting in serendipitous events that sort of get you from one place to the next. And it's just you have a lot of really cool stories about that. And and they they often involve cassette tapes. <laughs> uh, you were, I read somewhere that you were sort of early on, you were doing kind of a wean back X kind of thing that you call unlistenable now, but you actually made cassette tapes and then left them in bathrooms for people to find. So they yeah. would just sort of stumble across this music. Right before I went away to, to, right before I moved to OCAD from Halifax, I had been recording all these songs on my four track and this sampler thing. And they were weird. They were super weird. I was too embarrassed to like play them for anybody. But I got this idea where right before I moved, like literally the day before I moved, I made like 20 copies of these. I had like covers and everything. And I went around to Halifax and I put them in public bathrooms all around Halifax. And this is also 1999. So if you found a cassette tape in a bathroom, you'd probably listen to it. You know, yeah. it's like, it's not like now if you found a CD in a bathroom, you just throw it right in the garbage. Right. Like, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was a different thing. And so that was sort of my way of getting the music out there. Um, yeah. And so it was, it was just sort of, it was, it gave me something to like, like a goal. I was like, all right, I'm going to finish this. And then this is going to be how I release it. Um, and then weirdly, like three years later, I was back in Halifax and one in a coffee shop and my friend and I were sitting there and then the tape started playing on their like stereo. Like they, no way. They, I probably left it in that bathroom and they probably just had it in their collection and the brisk was like, Oh, what's this? And like put it on <laughs> this super weird music started playing. Wow, that's incredible! You just happened to be there when that was that was yeah. going on. And that kind of, like I like you said, like that kind of stuff happened to me so much throughout my career. I've had these really strange, serendipitous moments. Um, the way I actually got uh, my first gigs writing ads was I was working at Paul's Boutique, and I had made a CD of a bunch of stuff. It was way more listenable at this point. It was not quite as weird. <laughs> um, and I'd given it to the restaurant next door. And then uh, one afternoon, this guy walks in. And he's like, hey, are you Peter? I was like, yeah. He's like, they were just playing your CD next door. It's super weird and really rad. And I was like, oh, thanks. And he was like, "Like, wh what kind of stuff do you do? And I told him, and I told him, I really want to get into writing ads and stuff. He's like, yo, like I just started an ad company. We're doing like music and voice casting. Oh, no do you no. want to do some stuff for us? I'm like, yeah. And so that was actually my first handful of ads were through this company, a guy named Dan Garrett. He was an ex-pirate uh, employee. And we're still friends. Actually, I'm going to go see him tonight. I'm going over to his house, and we're going to oh, cool. drink wow. non non-alcoholic dad beers in his backyard. <laughs> was that before or after the license for Street Sense, which was sort of like your in introduction to... Uh, that was after. So the Street Sense thing is, again, in retrospect, really, really ridiculous. Um, my mom did wardrobe on Street Sense, so she knew like who all the players were, and she knew the directors and, and the producers. And I told her I was like, "Yeah, you know, like it'd be cool to get some, to see if I could get some music in Street Sense." Oh, also, my dad had written the theme song for for it. So if you actually oh, listen, wow. there's one theme song though. Where's my money go? I just don't know. My dad actually wrote that. Amazing. So, like, but my mom didn't want to like pull any strings for me. She's like, "Look, this is the producer's name." give her give her some music or something i don't know and i was like all right so i like made a demo on a cassette tape put it in an envelope wrote her name i think it was wendy purvis i think i still remember this and i just like walked over to cbc and i gave it to the security guard at the front <laughs> and then like two weeks later i get a phone call and she's like hey yeah we got your demo we'd love to use this music and i was like okay great and so they licensed it for one of their seasons and then i wrote more music for the following season and made enough money off my first SoCan check to buy a futon to sleep on. Wow. Which was great. <laughs> I think I was sleeping on like a mattress and some pillows on the floor. And, and in, in uh, classic composer fashion, you probably never used it to sleep because you're always working, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the ad work, what was your experience in that? Because I know that's, I, I've actually never really uh, been in that very much myself. So I don't, I know it's a grind from other people I know. Uh, I know it has very specific demands. What was your experience? What do you, what's the biggest thing you took away from that, the, those years? So, so I got into it in like the early 2000s. And I think that was... Like I know, I, I know Trevor Morris and Tom Third talked about this sort of like golden age of of ads. 
I think I came in right as that was ending because there, <laughs> I didn't really experience any golden age. I experienced kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of a, the slow decline. Well, yeah. Like I, like I wasn't walking away with boatloads of cash and you know, I wasn't like hiring musicians. It was all like demos in my bedroom kind of thing. Um, but the thing I've always loved about ads was it was like, uh, it's like, it's like, like screen composing boot camp. Mm. You know, you get thrown these, uh, these projects, these briefs, and they're like, all right, we need, you know, and this, Trevor talked about this very, very specifically. It's like, we need this style of music and this style of music and this style of music. And you're like, okay, I've never done that before. And then you go online, you listen to a bunch of music. Or back then, I would actually just go buy a bunch of used CDs and listen to the music, figure out what it was, and then, and then try to do it. Um, it was, but it, yeah, it was, it, there was no like go into the studio and make a record kind of thing. It was, it was like, like it is now. It was like sit at home by yourself in your studio and use a bunch of emulators and try to make something that doesn't sound awful. Which at the beginning, I mean, there was also this crossover point, I think, when I got into it. It was really hard because I think the days of the studio budgets were going down. So they were expecting everyone to kind of do it virtually. But like sample libraries still really sucked. It was like, 2001 like Miroslav was like the most kick-ass orchestral library you could get at the time and uh and so I like I was still using like Proteus modules and stuff like it was not they were not like, they didn't sound like none of those I would put on my reel now they, they didn't sound very good so it was it was actually a hard time actually I think to do ads because sonically like the budgets weren't there and the gear wasn't there wasn't hadn't really caught up to the low budgets yet right so from there, I mean, I think that now you have this amazing career where you're just, you know, working on all these really great shows, these series. Um, Durham County, I think, was your first uh, sort of introduction into the series writing world. And that comes through Tom Third, who we've mentioned, who was actually an instructor in a course that you were taking in OCAD. And that's yes. like eight years prior. So there's another really interesting serendipitous moment. You met Tom and eight years later, you you like, how does that all come together for Durham? So in my like second year at OCAD, um, we were signing up and the workload was really heavy and I was allowed to take one elective. Mm -hmm. So I went into student, student services and I was like, what am I allowed to take? And they're like, oh, you can take anything. I'm like, can I take anything from the art stream? And they're like, oh yeah, totally. And I look and there's this audio course. I'm like, oh, I can, I'll take the audio course. Like I know I can just walk in and do that and I'll get a good mark and I, don't, I won't have to worry about it. So I take this audio course. And, uh, and that was where I met, uh, where I met Tom. And that was a huge moment for me. I remember like our first class, he just started talking about what he was doing and he showed, he showed this Tide commercial. I'll never forget it because it blew my mind. It was like this Tide commercial and there were all these like horns blasting and it was like, it was, it was really cool. I remember seeing it and just like, what the hell? Like, how did he make that, you know? Um, and he also gave out a really kick-ass reading list of which I read every single book on it because oh, cool. a lot of it was screen composing or film music or whatever. And, uh, and so we, I don't know, like I, we, we got along really well and we kind of kept in touch a little bit over the years. And so when this Durham County thing happened, I had already started doing work with the music supervisor, Andrea Higgins. And Tom, I think, got hired on the, I think it was the listener, um, which was going to be like a really big workload. And so he couldn't do season two. And so they needed to, they needed to do something. And so they brought me in, both he and Andrea basically brought me in, put me in front of the producer and was like, hire Peter, he can do it. And uh, and yeah, and so that's so ultimately, I kind of got thrown into the fire and had to do a TV show that I'd never done. I'd done ads and I'd done little shorts, but I'd never done a TV show. I'd never de dealt with like weekly budgets. I'd never even had like a proper spotting session. So it was a really like, it was a very like sink or swim moment. Wow. And yeah. Part of the deal was I basically had like the Tom Third bat phone where at any point I could just like <laughs> call him and be like, <laughs> what the fuck do I do? Like, I don't know how to do this. And he was like, oh, you just do this. It's like, uh, okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> like click and then I'd, like work some more and do it and manage to, yeah, I ended up doing seasons two and three of, uh, of that and ultimately ended up doing more work for that producer. Um, Tom and I have both worked with that producer, particular producer a fair amount. Um, ever Is since, this Adrian so. Mitchell you're talking about? Yeah. 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 So yeah, she, I ended up doing bomb girls after that. We did two seasons of bomb girls and a movie. Or was it three seasons? No, it was two seasons of bomb girls and a movie. Yeah. She has very kind things to say about your work on that show. I want to read a quote just because it gets me into the next thing. She said, oh, dear. Uh, you have a kind of instinct that I haven't seen in a long time. He's able to somehow get inside the dark recesses of a character's mind, but still connect with them and understand them and evoke their humanity in the music he's working with. 
what, what do you attribute that to? How, how, where did that come from? Because nothing we've sort of talked about to this point would lead me to think that there was some experience that you had uh, where you are able to, is it empathy? Is it, uh, are you that's, just into dark stuff? You do a lot of reading? Like, how's that happen? That's fascinating. Um, I don't know, but one thing I will say was when I was working on Durham, it was a dark show. Like, it was a very, very dark show. And it kind of messed me up. Like, it was a really dark, brooding, relentless. Like, my dad couldn't even watch it. He was really excited. And oh, then he wow. watched the first yeah. few episodes. He's like, Peter, I love you. But, like, this show, like, <laughs> makes me really uncomfortable. Oh, wow. And, and I remember, like, it was, it was hard. It was, like, the first show I'd ever done. So I was, it was winter. I was really isolated. I wasn't seeing any of my friends because I was just putting every waking hour into this show. And wow. every waking hour was kind of supporting this really dark brooding very realistic storyline um and i remember coming out of season two and just being like man i need to just like i need a break like i need to just go out i need some sun i need some friends i need some beer i need to just like put this down yeah so i don't know like i don't know where i don't know yeah i, I don't know where i would have gotten that that was a really kind quote of her um really kind thing of her to say um i don't know i don't actually know the answer to that uh hmm. But, so uh, maybe it's just inborn. Maybe maybe it's the way you were raised. Maybe it's just a, a perspective you just naturally have. It wasn't something you had to 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 seek and to hunt. I hear yeah. that Adrian also was really good with describing what she wanted to hear without using musical terms. Yes. So her uh, she's not a very musical person, um, but she knows what she wants. She has very strong feelings about the music, but her musical language is not that of you know a typical composers and so yeah some of the famous some of the famous uh descriptions i got was the glassy sound it's like mm -hmm. i really like that glassy sound more of the glassy sound and then the the most famous one that we it's not famous but amongst the people on the show we all talk about the the reverse pterodactyl incident <laughs> which was just like you know do something really fucked up like like re reverse pterodactyl noises <laughs> it's just like I got you. I got you. I can do that. So, so it was really fun. Like it was cause that, that show, it was, the palette was traditional. Like it was like string quartet and like really messed up prepared pianos, but, and then all this other weird brooding sound design. Like at one point I remember figuring out that I could bow my garbage can. Oh, and wow. So I made a right. whole library of just like this really gnarly bowing my garbage can. And then I discovered I could bow my lampshades. So then I spent, <laughs> I just like started bowing everything. And I, I have all these libraries of like, like, can you, you know, that like YouTube channel, does it blend? Does it blend? So yeah. It was like, does it bow? Like, can you can bow I, it? That's what can amazing. I bow in here? And so I started kind of trying to bow my cat. Like, <laughs> and that's weird. when the SPCA stepped in and we're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you got to stop this Bowing problem. This is, this <laughs> yeah, is totally. out of control. Yeah, totally. that's great. Uh, so I'm hoping that this is something because I haven't really. Um, well, first of all, let me ask you this: like, was was the palette that you were working with it was that sort of established by Tom and you were picking up uh, yeah. where it was going from there? And did yeah, you and did you feel like you had a chance to make it your own, or were you sort of fitting into Tom's sound world to a certain extent? So that, I mean, that's why it was ultimately a really good first show to work on was because I was building on a lot of the sounds that, and, and themes and palette that Tom Thrift had already established. So the, the groundwork was already there. So season two, I was, I was basically just like trying to keep the Tom third ball rolling, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. And then once I got to season three, that's, you know, and then by season three, we had all these new characters. So then I got to really write all my own, start writing my own themes. And mm -hmm. even season two, there, I got to write a bunch of my own themes as well. But there were a lot of themes that I carried on that Tom wrote. Um, and then by season three, I feel like I had gotten to really start to, you know, flex my chops and really put my own sonic imprint on it. Right. Um, but it was a great, because of that, it was a great first show. You know, it was, because as any composer knows, like season one, episode one is always really hard you know that's always the hardest thing and right. season one episode one was done and season season one was done so i basically just got to like ease it was like getting instead of jumping in i got to kind of ease my way into the hot tub and then just kind of yeah but it was a hot hot tub nonetheless it was a hot hot tub yes it was still a very hot hot tub and it was a deep hot tub and it was a <laughs> it was a scary hot tub filled with sharks and filled with sharks yeah <laughs> 
But, uh, you know, and then Tom was off to the edge with a little life thing that he'd occasionally throw in. And here, <laughs> you're fine, man. You're fine. You know, there's also that- a, an ongoing joke. Andrea was known as uh, the music supervisor. was known as talking Peter off the ledge. Mm. Early on in my career, it was, uh, you know, when things would get really scary, you know, sometimes Andrea had to call me up and talk me off the ledge, which is sort of funny. I haven't had to be talked off the ledge in a long time, but at the time it was kind of a known, it was a known thing. It's a lot all at once. I mean, you're, you're getting thrown into the deep end without much experience. And then, you know, and I think it's interesting. It's sort of like lots of pressure. And then this really dark show that you're really investing yourself in. I mean, this idea of being able to engage with a narrative like that and separate yourself from it, I think is sort of something you learn to do over time. Like mm-hmm. I know, I know people who are actors who got roles and they're still messed up by them, you know, they, mm-hmm. cause they really yeah, have yeah. to go deep with it. Totally. So I wanted to talk about this idea of abstraction because um, that was mentioned somewhere and I don't know exactly where, but this idea that not only can you take sounds and music and abstract them from what we normally uh, would be expecting as an audience, but also the idea that in um, narrative, you can create abstraction in terms of like a distance from an emotion or t- say in a, or have a, have a statement about an emotion or, or provide the audience with an idea about an emotional thing or idea without saying the obvious, right? Can you talk a bit about that? Because I know you were talking about using found sounds, which I think was sort of started by like your time at OCAD with this idea of like, you know, taking things and decontextualizing them. And then this idea, I think I also read that you would go to Value Village and find little toy packs and circuit bend stuff. And Mm -hmm. I don't think I know anyone else other than myself who's kind of gotten into the circuit bending side of things. How do you, how do you think about that? Well, I mean, for me, a lot of it is just trying to find, uh, just trying to find sounds that aren't used to death. I think that was like that, that's what ultimately has like fueled me to go do those things to like circuit bend and to bow things and come up with weird sounds because there's so many good sample libraries come out of it and they all sound so awesome. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It, they, they all sound so good, but I do think it's creating a, this very homogenous sound in, in film and TV, you know, and it's, 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 it, 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 it's just sort of, you don't like, you don't want to sound like that if you can help it. And so for me, the idea, like, I remember when I first started, uh, circuit bending, it was just like, I, I felt like I was mining these sounds. I'm like, no one is ever going to have this sound yeah, in their score. Right. You know what I mean? And, and that was like, that was really exciting for me. And so I got really into for a long time trying to come up with, sounds that no one else would do and so that so yeah and i still do that you know i still go, th- go out and you know do weird sampling and 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 lots of like strange you know manipulation and i think I'll, i think the, the thing that drives any abstract sound that i'm going for is trying to just come up with an original palette um and then also like there's something about throwing these really weird atonal sounds that you can't pick your put your fingers on it alongside something that's more you know like we hear an orchestra you know it's an orchestra you hear a string quartet you know it's an or- a string or a string quartet but then you start having this weird thing looping behind it and you don't know what that is it just f- creates like a cool counterpoint to what you're writing and gives it your own sonic stamp there is something i remember when i was doing a lot of uh, electronic music and edm writing i had this one of my sort of philosophies when i was writing was it's either got to have uh, like a really clear hook or a really clear sonic thing. It has to have something that a friend can describe it to their, f- to, to another friend. Like right. that was the thing. So yeah. it's either like hum a song, hum a, a, a melody, repeat a lyric or describe like a weird sound that is like the focus of it. And that became, because it was so easy, like most EDM all just sounds the same, but if you can create something that can, has like a descri- something that you can verbally describe to someone else to me that was my goal like mm-hmm. every time you know if i can't get a melody stuck in your head i want to get a sound stuck in your head or a lyric stuck in your head right who's doing interesting stuff these days like wh- where do you go to sort of be inspired for that kind of uh sound exploration oh that's that's tough um i'm in a weird place right now musically uh because i have uh I have two kids, and so I spend a lot of time listening to music that they enjoy. Okay. Um, but I mean, f- funny enough, that's that leads to uh, 
I try to I try to sneak good. You know, she's really she really likes Henry Mancini, one, oh, one of my daughters. She's nice. Specific, yeah. Specifically, the Peter Gunn soundtrack. She's of course. Really into. There's a <laughs> couple songs on there that she really really enjoys. Yeah. Um, and then all the Pee Wee, uh, all the Pee Wee soundtracks, both the, the Elfman and the um, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh stuff. Yep. Uh, she's really into those. So I don't actually get to listen to a lot of like. Uh, weird stuff unless I'm running and so like like last summer I spent a lot of the summer I was running 10k every day and every day I was listening to different scores and that was really fun because I, I like I would go through and I would I, mean, I have all these like playlists that mm -hmm. every time I hear a song I'll put it in a playlist like oh that that that's really cool that'd be a cool idea for when on earth that'd be a cool idea for working moms that'd be and so I'm constantly like every time I hear something that I find inspiring or has something to it that I really like I pop it in one of my folders and I remember, so last summer, I remember I ended up with a really big Winona Earp uh, folder. And there was a lot of really cool stuff that uh, Henry, Henry Jackman mm -hmm. was doing. He had some stuff that, was, that I was getting really excited about. I mean, there's always really cool Zimmer stuff. Um, Jackman was, like, killing it constantly, though. There's something about him that, like, every time I would listen to one of his scores, they would, he, he would either, it would either be, like, super classic film awesome you know melodic thematic stuff or it would just be like winter soldier really intense dark brooding electronic stuff and uh i was really into that but a lot of it yeah is like when i'm working out if i'm running i just listen to film scores and then try to like keep track of the ones that inspire me are you into uh the work of sonder urians and uh, danny bensey i'm not no okay Should they I do be? stuff like um they do very textural organic very like the kind of stuff that we're talking about, very abstract kind of mm. sounds to accompany some very dark stuff like um, Ozark is probably what they're best known for now. Oh, right, right. Yeah, they're, they're kind of cool. That's interesting. And uh, so to, to sort of turn on a dime there uh, in terms of the sounds, doing very different work on working moms. Mm -hmm. what, how would you describe your approach there? And what's, what's, the, what's the general idea in your working relationship with the producers? So Work and Moms is a really, really fun show to work on. The story with that, it was interesting. When I got brought onto that show, um, I, can't, I can't speak 100% for what the producers were thinking, but this is the impression that this is what I think was kind of what was going on. Uh, my understanding is that they didn't even want a composer. They ah. originally wanted to just use licensed music, um, which is, you know, an awesome idea. Uh, unfortunately, that's also super expensive, mm -hmm. you know, especially if it's like licensed music that everyone knows about. And... The producers are huge music fans, and they have very good taste in music. Uh, but you know, to license a lot of the music that they like, I think would have would have been really difficult. So they brought me in as sort of a plan B to kind of like augment it. Yeah. Um, and so they brought it was myself and Maylee Todd. So we we would work together on that. And the the style of the show it's very it's very modern. It's very kind of upbeat, kind of like sassy hip-hop electronic lots of shouting lots of vocal noises lots of acapella kind of craziness um so the way that uh Maylee and I work on that is uh, it's really fun about at the beginning of every season she'll come over and we'll spend an afternoon just like messing around we'll throw up a mic and we'll just get her to just go crazy we'll get all <laughs> sorts of weird acapella sounds like she's an amazing artist and an, an incredible uh incredible uh musician and songwriter um and uh, actually, I'm, she's about to move to Los Angeles, which I'm very sad about. Oh. But uh, I'm also very happy for her, but I'm also very sad. Uh, and so, she, so we would just build these libraries of, like, you know, grunting and screaming and breathing and, and, and just, like, loops and stuff. And I would take it and I would format them all into my logic template. So I just have, like, hundreds of tracks of just melee shouting crazy stuff. Um, and so then when it comes time to actually write, I'll use that and so I'm kind of like remixing her vocals as I'm writing and then usually about once every episode or two there'll be a cue that might need more a little bit more like emotional uh vocal stuff so then I'll you know often demo something up and send it to her and she'll write a bunch of stuff and come back send it back to me and um and so yeah so it's it's a, it's a really fun way to work work together um what's the concept behind like just the vocal noises like where, where did that idea come from Oh, man, I don't, I don't know. Season one, it was again, season one, episode one was crazy. We were writing all these demos. 
you're having a really hard time um, sort of finding the sound of the show. I think there was like a Tune Yard song that the producers really liked, and she was doing a lot cool. of interesting yeah. vocal stuff. Yeah. And I think that became kind of like a touchstone or like, oh, like that's a neat idea. And then there were these other sort of, uh, someone described it recently as like kind of like sassy cheerleader style tracks. Lots of like, yeah, like shouting. And so we started doing that. And then I think it actually also started with season one, we weren't doing the library thing. She was actually coming over and recording stuff on every okay, cue. right. And then when season two started, this is what happened. I went through all of the cues and I took out all of her vocals and I chopped them all up. And that was where the library thing started. Oh, uh, okay. And that's when we realized like, oh, this is a really good way to work. Because she's also super busy in her own right. She's got like a whole music career, just signed a big record deal. So... So yeah, so that was where that was where it where it all came from. And then that just became the sound of the show and people started responding to it and everyone got really into it. And so it just it gave it sort of a um like 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 a, a very like it it ended up giving it a sort of a, a a female spin on it. So you have like these female vocals in it and gave I don't know, it just kind of gave it like a, a fun sassiness that mm -hmm. it wouldn't have if it was just like hip hop beats going like whatever like there's nothing really neat or new about that. It's just amazing how much texture and emotion and quality the human voice, whether it's making a fart sound or, you know, making a vocal shout or something, it really just adds so much. It really does. It really, yeah. really does. Yeah. There's one, there's one really fun one I have where it's like, uh, like I basically built like a melee, melee Todd Mellotron where I can just like play <laughs> all, like all these different vowels of her just like humming and singing and stuff. Cool. So if you listen, wow. So you can do really fun stuff like that. And it's also become a, a big joke in the in the actual playbacks because, you know, so sometimes we go too far and sometimes Maylee's just yelling crazy <laughs> shit and the producers are just like, <laughs> what, like you know, like, you know, just like, throw your hands in the air, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and they're just like, Peter, can you guys just like dial it back a little bit? You know, it's like getting pretty, some, some of the cues have gotten pretty funny. And then some of them have been so ridiculous and the, everyone falls over laughing and we keep them. Amazing. Um, wow. So uh, there's another layer to the whole uh, comedy aspect that's being played. You're actually adding a whole separate character essentially to the show. Yeah. 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 And then sometimes I've, I've been known to make like joke tracks where it's like, uh, I, I, I'm a bit of a prankster. So I often like to sneak in little, you know, like one, one year I made like a Seinfeld style track that oh, was, no. but it was all Maylee Todd <laughs> voices with like slap bass. Yeah. Um, another time I actually remixed, Catherine Wrightman, the producer, I recorded her singing this demo of how she wanted a track to sound, and it's her just yelling obscenities, and then I chopped up the obscenities and turned it into a whole song, and then put it over the credits of the finale. Oh, man. You know, I don't know. I just like I just love doing stuff like that, because it's that's just silly great. and funny. Oh, that's so fun. So, yeah. so you must have a pretty good relationship with them, the producers and everybody else in the room, and when you're doing mix downs, that that kind of stuff doesn't... Yeah, isn't we've definitely angle. gotten... We've definitely gotten to a point, you know, we're coming up on season six. Season one and two were definitely, th like, those were pretty hard because we were still trying to figure out the show. We were still trying to figure each other out. And now I think, like, like I have so much fun working on that show. Mm. And everybody in that room is, you know, has a great sense of humor and is really, like, the playbacks are always really fun. I'm really sad. Like, the last two years have been, last two seasons have been virtual and it's just not yeah. the same, you know. Yeah. And it's one of those shows where... There's so like like meetings are always filled with hysterics and laughter and you know Catherine the the producer's really really funny and I don't know I, like I miss I like that's something I really miss I do I really miss all of the the shenanigans from you know being in a room with all those people. This podcast is brought to you by the Screen Composers Guild of Canada, celebrating its 40th year in 2020. The SCGC is a national association of professional music composers and producers for film, television, and media, whose mission includes promoting the music, status, and rights for film, television, and media composers in Canada. Special thanks to the SOCAN Foundation for financial support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers. And now, back to our show. You were saying earlier that there's a real pressure, or maybe not a pressure is not the right word, but there is a focus on staying current and staying on top of musical styles. If you were only working on this show uh, and you didn't have other things going on, would you feel like your voice as a composer was being 
uh, you know, kind of uh, snowed over by, by that activity? Or is that something you enjoy and, and is fun? I like it. It's, it is, there's, there's a pressure. I mean, I, I have a real problem with getting old. It bothers me. I don't like it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to turn 41, I think. And, and I feel it. Like I hear me, like there's a lot of music I listen to. I'm just like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, this is, this sounds awful. <laughs> but then you like, you force yourself, like I, but I still force myself to listen to it. And I force myself yeah. to figure out what makes it tick, you know? And so I still like, I still, I'm constantly listening to music I don't necessarily enjoy yeah. trying to like figure out and and often you know it'll flip sometimes I'll hear a track enough times and then I'm like oh I get this this is this is great you know um and then there, sometimes there's just music I'm just not into but I do spend a lot of time listening to current music trying just to like because I don't want to be I have this okay this is like a weird hang up I have so that back go back to the days of when I was a kid and my dad managed that music store there was right. a keyboard department there I remember growing up, I would always walk in and I'd look at the keyboards and a couple of the keyboard guys would be like, yeah, like check out this cool synth. And then they'd be like, beep, 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 beep. And they'd play like jump or like really corny techno. And I'd be sitting there going like, man, you are so old. You don't, this is the corniest music ever. <laughs> and I have this, and I, and you know, I was like probably like 14 and they were probably only like 25 at the time, but it was enough that I was like, you guys don't know what's cool. And I have this constant fear of being the guy playing jump on a synthesizer in front of kids and them being like what the fuck is this guy doing you know so yeah like it's i have this that's like a thing that plays in my head whenever i start to feel like i don't understand this music it's like no go figure it out man you got to go figure it out like don't be the guy playing jump which is interesting because with your work uh with uh, another uh, uh guild member rob carley on um Winona Earp, you have been getting more and more into the orchestral side of things. Uh, and, and, you know, you've been really, you know, putting in the work, you know, really woodshedding on that stuff, which if you want to talk about old stuff, uh, I mean, it, it don't get no older than the orchestra in terms of, yeah. you know, that <laughs> if you, you know, for modern music anyways. Um, what, what's that? Where does that sort of fit in with everything? Because I think, you know, there's a sort of idea of keeping current with really uh, the, the sort of bleeding edge of stuff. And then there's the sort of general study of music and, and being able to do all the things and have all the tools at your disposal. Well, mm -hmm. What's been the thing that's sort of been driving that interest in orchestral music? Uh, you know what it is? It's that it's it's become uh, the, 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 the excitement. It, it's, it excites me the same way, like when I first started getting into guitars as a teenager and, and I was learning about all the different guitars and all the different amps and all the different pedals and, oh, to get this sound on that record, you did this. And, you know, like that was exciting. And then I remember feeling that way um, with synthesizers. Like when I first started learning about synthesizers, it was like, oh, like this is how you do that. And this is the synth that sounds like this. And I, and I, and it was just this like, it would like blow the lid off part of my brain. And I would just get really, really excited about like, really inspired and excited to learn as much as I can about it. And so, you know, I did that with synthesizers. I got like really deep into synths for a long time. And then I got really deep into sampling and drum machines and all, all that stuff. And and through a big waste of time with the modular stuff, which I don't <laughs> recommend anybody do if you want to have any time. Um, but then when I started, uh, when I started uh, ERP, I had like pretty basic orchestral stuff. Like I could, I could get by, but I had to, I had to go up next to Rob, you know? So the way we would do it is he would write half the cues, I'd write half the cues, and then some of the cues we would do together. Right. And when we, when I was brought on that show, I was sort of pitched as the young producer guy so I was going to go in and make the show weird and crazy and synthed out and bombastic and Rob was kind of pitched as the the orchestral guy and then together we were going to make this crazy hybrid score and that's kind of what happened in season one but by season two Rob was getting really pumped on a lot of the synth stuff and I was starting to get really excited on all the orchestral stuff and in order for my cues to stand up next to Rob's like I had a lot of wood shedding to do. And I, so I went like really hard and I started like really, you know, studying in, I started studying orchestration and studying just like writing as much as I can and going, going deep. Um, and Rob did the same with synths. And so it got to a point where by like, you know, by the last season, no one can tell who wrote what anymore. And it's sort of become a little bit of a joke, but, uh, but it just, there's something about writing for orchestra now that I just find it, um, 
I find it exciting. I feel like I've just been, someone has just shown me like this whole new crazy group of synthesizers I never knew existed, you know? Cause I mean, that's sort of what it is. I mean, orchestral writing is basically additive synthesis. It's in a way, you know what I mean? It's just like adding all these things and knowing how the tones affect each other and how to blend them all. And, um, and then there's also just something really fun I find about the like, the, the communicate, I mean, it almost goes back to, to my Oak had days where it's like notating to me feels the same as, you know, when we were doing drawing plans and it's like, you're, you're giving very precise instructions to someone and making sure they understand it while staying within these conventions. And that I also find really fun. Um, yeah, I find like this sort of the communicating, like, well, you're, when you're notating and, and, and you're communicating with these musicians and making sure that they fully understand what you're doing and hopefully not looking like an idiot, which is my biggest fear. You know, <laughs> I just don't want everyone to look like an idiot. <laughs> right. What was, uh, what's some, what can you sort of point to that was a big takeaway from your time working with Rob, something he said to you or showed you or his, oh, his whole style of working? Working with Rob was like, I was awesome because Rob, um, he's a phenomenal composer. He, that dude is like, he's a monster, especially when it comes to orchestral writing. He can do it. First time I ever saw Rob write, he was writing a cue um, on something that I was working out and working on. And I went over to his place and he started writing and he was like, the, the picture was playing on the screen and he just starts playing along and he's looking over his shoulder at me going like, yeah, that sounds good, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like, yeah, like it's something like that. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, yeah, that, no, that's good. And I was just like, we weren't even looking, man. And it sounded amazing, you know. So Rob, Rob is really, really good. And the thing, there were two big things that I took away from Rob. Um, one of them is funny. One of them is um, ensemble patches are okay. It's okay to use ensemble patches. All right. Uh, they're just another tool. Like obviously, if you're writing for an actual orchestra, you have to be really careful with them. Yeah. But. I, like just in, th in like early on in like you know as you're like learning to write there's all this uh what's, what's the word i'm looking for uh it's very uh poo pooed to use to, to, to use ensemble patches it's cheating it's not right it, you know they don't sound right blah, blah blah but there's just another there's just another tool and use those along with you know all your other stuff and you can write quickly because the thing that i've learned from rob is how to write quickly because rob mm. can write super super fast yeah the other thing he taught me was and this sort of goes back to the ensemble patch a little thing is uh, know where to spend your time. You know, like every cue does not deserve 100% of your energy 100% mm. of the time. And I remember learning that in season two, there was this really epic moment where like all these guys with machine guns and hand grenades are de descending on this cabin and everyone's freaking out and there's like, they're shooting out the windows and hand grenades are flying in through. And I wrote this super crazy epic cue for it. I was really proud of it, and I remember Rob heard it. He's like, "That this is like an awesome cue, but like, no one's gonna hear it." And I was like, "What do you mean?" And then, sure enough, we go to playback, and it was just machine guns yeah. the whole time. <laughs> machine guns, just machine guns, and uh, hand grenades. Yeah. And that was a moment I was like, "Right." And I noticed that he would do that. There were like, there were cues that he would spend a lot more time on, and you know, the, the intimate cues, the ones where there's just dialogue, there's not a lot going on, really emotional moments. Like that's where you like put your money in, but. Yeah, like if it's if it, if there's like huge like tractors driving around and explosions and air, you know, it's like don't waste your time. Well, I mean, obviously, do the best cue you can for that scene, but there's probably other parts of the show that are going to require way more energy. Yeah, and that was something that I took took away from him. Because also the thing is, is like we'd both be working on like other stuff at the time. Like he's often working on another show. There have been times where I've had to juggle ERP and a film at the same time. So I spent a lot of time really working on trying to get faster and working with Rob uh, definitely taught me how to work a lot faster. Mm. That's great. I love it. Another sort of serendipitous uh, thing that sort of ended up turning out really well for you, uh, and it's got nothing to do with screen composing, but I just think the story is so cool, about a project that you work on, worked on while you were on a layover at, in Chicago. Um, that ended up really blowing up. And I, I think you said it was actually what cinched a couple of really big pitches for you at the end. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about Daft Science? I can. So, yeah, so Daft Science was, um, I was on a layover in Chicago. I was on my way to South by Southwest. I was going to be DJing for a bunch of artists there. And I was by myself. And I, all I had with me was my laptop. 
and I had like all my DJ stuff on there, but I didn't have any of my sample drives and I had like five hours to kill and I was really bored. So um, I had some Beastie Boys acapellas in my iTunes library. And so I was just, I threw one of them up in Logic and then I just started grabbing uh, Daft Punk tracks and just like, cause that's all I had. I was like, I didn't have libraries. So I just started like chopping up Daft Punk tracks and I ended up doing, I don't remember what the first one I did was, but I did about half of it in this airport and got to Austin, landed. My friends picked me up in the car and I was like, guys, check this out. And I like plugged it into the aux thing of the, of the car. And they were all like, dude, you need to finish this. This is hilarious. So I was like, all right. So I got home, finished it, played it for two friends of mine who owned a graphic design company. They had done all like the coins logos and stuff. And they heard it and they were like, dude, you need to make an album. You need to do more of these and make a whole album. And if you do it, we'll do all the cover art for free. And I was like, all right, you know, like if my friends are all really into this, you know, it was like a lot of my friends were just sort of like pushing me and encouraging me to do it. Right. So this was like in between, I think, Bomb Girl season two and the movie. I think, I think it was about that. So I just had some time. So I just spent a few months and I just worked on this, this album, made it, put it on the internet uh, and then nothing happened. It was like, there's just nobody cared. I think a few people on Reddit were like, oh yeah, that's cool. But like all my friends liked it and that was cool enough for me. And sometimes I'd play when I was DJing and that was fun. And then it was like four years later, it was a Tuesday in March. I remember this, I was lying in bed and my phone, I get like a notification on my phone. I look and a friend of mine has tagged me in a Facebook post by dancing astronaut. And it was like, this guy remixed a bunch of Beastie Boys tracks only using Daft Punk samples. And I was like, oh man, like someone ripped off my idea. <laughs> and then I looked at it and I was like, oh, weird. They're like posting this thing that I did four years ago. Well, that's cool. But then it was like this exponential wave. It just started going, like literally every hour my phone was blowing up more and more and more. And it started going completely viral and started getting picked up by all of these media outlets. Like big ones, Time Time picked it up, Esquire, yeah. like everybody. People, Maxim, Billboard, it was like, it went completely, completely crazy. And um, I basically had a panic attack. Like I freaked out because I thought I was about to get sued. I was oh, like, yeah. I wanted people to hear this. I didn't want this many people to hear this. <laughs> like this is freaking me out. It and was like millions of people now. It was going completely nuts to the yeah. point where Bandcamp, um, I ran out of free downloads and I had to start like paying Bandcamp to keep it free or else they were going to start charging people. Oh, um, yeah. And I don't, I didn't want to make any money because I was scared if I made money, then I would get in trouble. Yeah. I was like really freaking out. Um, like I didn't enjoy that was, and also that was the f week of like season one, episode one of working mom. So I was oh already, I was already stressed out. Oh Meanwhile, this crazy thing was blowing up. Right. And I started getting all these emails and all these messages from like people I went to high school with. I had one guy I went to daycare with messaged me. He's like, <laughs> I'm in New Orleans in a bar and someone's playing your record. And I was wow. like, this is, it was really like, it was wild. Um, but I never, you know, I, I was always, I was very conscious to not make, I didn't want to make any money off of it. I was really, sure. you know, the one thing I did get was when Esquire covered it, I sent them a thing and I was like, thanks for covering my record. Can you send me some fashionable socks? And they were like, fuck yeah. And then like a week later, a box of really cool socks showed up at my house, which was pretty, that was, that's the only like monetary thing I got right. for that record. Um, but it did, um, it did ultimately at least three, one TV show and two films. Wow. Um, were ultimately that I think that was what kind of pushed it over the edge where I pitched on these shows. They liked my demo. Then when they went to see who I was, they were like, Oh, he's the guy that did that. I love that album. And then that basically sealed the deal. So it ended up, it did end up helping my career a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was a wild, crazy, scary week. And then the crazy thing was after the news cycle was over, it was like a week long, nothing. No, like my it phone just died just completely. Died. So, did you ever feel any pressure to follow it up, or did anyone come out of the work and say like, "You got to keep doing this and change you your whole what? thing"? I did, and it kind of it kind of messed me up a little bit. So, I had after that, I had like a huge following. Um, I had like a, a huge Mailchimp chimp account at that point because I had gotten all these email addresses, like tens and tens of thousands of people. Wow. Um, 
And so I felt like, you know what? I'm going to use this opportunity to try to like promote my friends. So I actually made um, a mixtape uh, of just like all sorts of cool Canadian underground independent hip hop. Yeah. And I just released that solely because I was like, you know what? I got my spotlight, but I also have all these awesome friends who are like really talented. So I put out this mixtape kind of yeah. hoping that I could leverage um, that, you know, uh, exposure and hopefully help help them out a little bit right yeah um so yeah so i did put out a mixtape afterwards but it, honestly it became kind of a i don't really have time to write that kind of stuff anymore you know like i'm pretty full up with screen composing um i do miss doing it but ultimately i just don't really have time to mm -hmm. do it which is yeah. you know i have like a family and and, and, and a career and not much of a life. So like, I don't have a lot of time to just like, you know, if I'm down here writing like weird hip hop EDM remixes, my wife's upstairs kind of going like, well, maybe you should be up here <laughs> giving this kid a bottle, <laughs> you know? So. But Billboard said my remixes were the top eight ever done. So there. <laughs> yes, they they did, they did say that. Yeah, you can, you you can always pull that one out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So much of what we do is energy management. I think that's sort of the key thing to like, and, and beyond just, you know, whether you can take on a job or not, or whether you can successfully complete uh, your schedule, it's just in terms of your happiness and, and, and general well-being. like there has to be a limit. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't suddenly do go, or, you know, this funny thing, you think you get the, this idea that you've gotten a little bit of momentum and that somehow you'll be able to capitalize on that without really having to just pour 110% of yourself into something else and then who knows where that goes. Mm -hmm. But what a, what a fun ride. I mean, it, well, it sounded like it was both fun and stressful. <laughs> it was, you know, like it did, it did also, yeah, it, it, uh, it did like, it opened some doors. It definitely, you know, there are people that would definitely like answer the phone that wouldn't, um, have answered the phone had they not, um, you know, I'm, I, it actually led to, and one of the funny things was it led to me working with Tom Green uh, on his album, I ended up doing some beats for him again, just because he heard the album on Twitter and we ended up chatting and that's great. chatting on Twitter and like nerding out. turns out he's like a huge gear nerd. So we were nerding out about like preamps and compressors and stuff. And so, um, so yeah, so when my wife, my wife and I went to Los Angeles, we like hung out with him a bunch and it was really fun and made some music there. And it like, it, it did sort of open doors. I'd like it to like, people were a little more interested in what I was doing. Uh, after that, so that was really yeah, it was fun. Where's the where does the name Coins come from? That was just a dumb name. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing, just really little to it. It it was, I actually didn't come up with it. Uh, I had another name that was really dumb, and I can't even. I'm just gonna say that I can't remember it because it was so dumb. Uh, right. <laughs> but those my friends who um, own that graphic design company. When I went to them, I was like, I want to get like a logo made. They were like, this name's stupid. You we're not. You need to make a better name if we're gonna do a logo. And I was like. All right. And so they came up with coins because it was sort of video gamey. Uh, had like a cool, you know, it was, it was just sort of a thing at the time. We were just like, because the, the origin of coins was actually came from the, a place where I didn't like electronic music at the time. I was okay. deep into hip hop. I was deep into like underground garage rock. Um, I was in and I was getting it like I, I was into certain subgenres of electronic music, but the sort of like full on you know, EDM house stuff that was just starting to happen. This is like l mid late two thousands. I was just like, I'm not into this. I don't like this, but I can tell there's something here. And so I was like, I'm going to make an album of this. I'm just going to learn how to do it. And I'm going to gonna just like do, you know, I'm just going to do it. And so I spent, uh, you know, I remember I, every day when I was going running, I would just listen and listen and listen and listen and just absorb and absorb and study and study and study it. And then I ended up making an EP, uh, which ended up uh, getting signed to, to a Swedish record label, which was hilarious. Wow. And then came out with another album after that. Um, one of those songs we got licensed on to, it was me and a, another woman singing on it named Dolls. And we licensed that to a big Rimmel UK makeup commercial. Um, and so it all like, it, it actually started with me just being like, I don't understand this. I want to learn how to do it. And so I just sort of like just jumped in and just learned how to do it. And so that was how coins kind of, it sort of was like a little bit of a, it wasn't a joke, but it was sort of like, can I, can I do this? Let's see if I can do this. I don't know. Um, and so that's how coins came to be. Um, 
it was all ulti- yeah it was ultimately ju- me just proving to myself that i could that I, I was like i could do that that's awesome let me, see, let me see if i can do it yeah so a little bit of a video games you kind of uh, reference there which i can totally use as a pivot to my next question about video games ah thank you for that <laughs> you've worked on some you know pretty well-known titles like guacamole and little big planet karting What's your sort of approach to that kind of work, and how do you see it as being different from the film and TV stuff? The schedules are totally different. It's a completely different world. The schedules, you know, as, as I'm sure most people listening know in TV and film, TV TV are the most grueling. Uh, film is probably the next most grueling. Uh, whereas video games, like it takes them a long time to make a video game. And you don't necessarily have to wait until picture lock and start writing so you can often start writing right from from the beginning as long as they have you know concept art that they can send you and they have a basic idea of what they want you can start writing you know week one maybe not week one we'll say like month one um and so you can have like a year to to do a video game which is pretty great um and so within that you know i like to i I don't know like guacamole was a was a really fun one because i i didn't know I was I definitely had to sort of draw on my my experience in the ad world where I went in and they wanted this like very authentic mariachi music. <laughs> um and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I can do that." And you know, I never really listened to mariachi music before, but I'm sure I can do it. And so I went out and I like, same thing, I made all these playlists. I listened to it. I did all this research for a couple of weeks and just like learned about the history of Mexican folk music. I ended up tracking down a friend of mine had a guitar on it, a vihuela, and so I borrowed those and watched YouTube videos and learned how to play them well enough, you know. And uh, and then it was really fun. And then I just spent the next you know year chipping away at the score for it. And then we had to they had an employee there who was from Mexico, and everything had to go through him to make sure we weren't like bastardizing it. And so and there was sometimes where he would come back and be like, you know, you're kind of like you're, you're kind of slipping out. This is this is more like. This is like a tango, and that's totally not even close. And be like, oh yeah, you're right. You're totally right. You know. And so then you send it back, and you t- you tweak it and fix it. Um, but yeah, like that. Yeah, it was it was a really fun project to work on. Do you? I, what's your background in terms of like playing video games or knowing about how video games are developed? And th- were you ever? Uh, was there ever a stumbling block or a l- sharp learning curve in terms of like having to learn pr- other programs or sort of placing stuff into using FMOD and stuff like that? No, you know, so here's a funny thing. I I have somehow managed to get through my career and I have never had to learn FMOD or WISE or any of those programs. Um, I've always worked where they've had like a music supervisor who takes care of it and they just tell you, they explain to you how, how you're going to do it. So they're like, okay, this is what the game engine's doing. So when you write it, we want the music to be able to do this. And I understand enough about audio and stems that I can just be like, okay, I understand. And, you know, yeah. and so it's always just sort of been like that. Um, I've never, I even, there was one, there was one game I worked on called the castle game and I did all of the score and the sound effects for it. And I got really excited um, working on that. Like I was like, I want to, you know, I want to do it. I want to get in here. I want to, I want to get my hands dirty, especially, you know, he wanted it to work in surround. So I was like, getting rid of, but ultimately he was just like yeah no like just send me this stuff i'll just do it it's no big deal and so i didn't even get to like get my hands dirty and i really wanted to like i you know did do some learning and got my hands a little bit dirty but ultimately he just he was like yeah no i got it you just work on the music and, and i'll implement it all for you so <laughs> i've never actually had to do any of that um my experience with a lot of those video game um engines are is like very little Huh. It's not not because I don't want to. It's just no one's ever required it of me. What's the what's the best part about working in games versus other mediums? Um, at the beginning, <clears throat> I noticed this was a something I really loved the pop cultural, the cultural references that I was being given were way more my generation. Oh, um, okay. Often I'd be working with producers, and you know, by the time you're a successful producer running awesome shows. You've been around a while, and you your cultural ref, your you know musical references are probably not the same as mine. Especially when I got in, you know, I was in my mid twenties, working for producers that were in their mid fifties. We weren't necessarily seeing, we didn't have the same touchstones. Whereas working in video games, suddenly I was you know twenty eight, working with other twenty eight year olds and talking about a lot of current music that we were both really into and that was really exciting the other thing that i find and this is just a theory i have and i don't know if it's real i don't know if it's true but this is just something that i've 
I'm kind of I've kind of wondered about is I think people that make video games st probably started in a position where they were working under people. You know, mm. they were probably animating or coding for another company and then they broke out and started making started their own video game company. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think they understand how to give feedback because they've been uh -huh. given a lot of feedback. Right. I don't know if this is true, but I've just found that anytime I work with video game companies, it's always, they're always so good at, and so understanding, you know what I mean? It's, it's never just like, you never get a note being like, this sucks, can you do it again? You never get that note from video game people. I've never gotten that, that note from a video game studio. Maybe it exists, maybe I've just gotten really lucky. You know, I've, I've gotten that note from like producers. Maybe not quite that harsh, but I've definitely gotten like, this isn't working, do it again. You know, um, so there is something, I think there's a generational thing with video games that's a little bit different than working with, um, and it's all, no, like I've definitely worked with younger producers and, and stuff, but, yeah. uh, I just find the video game communities a little more, we just have more cultural touchstones to draw, to draw from. Yeah. I think. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think in my very limited experience with uh, video games, I have found that they are much better at the, I guess you call it the shit sandwich. You know, they, they, they give you really good feedback and, and sort of, they seem to understand genuinely what it takes to make things, mm -hmm. uh, yes. which is, which is a nice difference. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely kind of the cool thing. Uh, I asked you before we were chatting, um, about, uh, you know, something you wanted to talk about or a message you would have for people. And you talked about this idea of being able to take a good punch and how hard it was for you starting out and the pressures of beginning, mm -hmm. um, dealing with uh, communication, dealing with difficult people, uh, anxiety, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was something that I, that, that I think was one of the hardest parts of my career. There's like, you can learn, there's so, like, there's so many skills involved in doing this for a career. You know, there's like, all, there's all the different s styles. You, have, you know, there's, the, there's the, the, the production, the writing, the actual scoring a picture. There's all the technical stuff. There's the orchestration, the synths, the drums, like the like. There's, there's just so much of that stuff that you can spend a lot of time working on. But for me, I think like something that was really hard was learning to deal with the with. There's a lot of pressure and anxiety, especially at the beginning. Um, that is really really hard when you're starting. Like when you're starting, I think you you really and I it's I was just thinking about this because I just had I've had like two conversations with some friends of mine who are somewhat new to the business who were going through some like some some pretty hard moments in their in, in some projects that they're working on. And I just remember like I remember what that's like. I remember you get these notes and it feels like everything's falling apart. It feels like everything's riding on this one episode of this one thing that you're doing and I think like it's I think it's just worth mentioning that that's like totally normal at the beginning of your career and that's a skill that you learn you know like I at the very beginning like I, I was on anxiety medication for a while like I just couldn't handle the stress it was like I couldn't sleep I was like it was it was really 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 hard um, now you know I've just I know how to I've gotten a lot better at communicating I've gotten a lot better at perspective you know again like we were talking before someone throws at a cue I still have lots of reasons to be happy that I wrote that cue. You know, I'm not gonna be like upset that we're throwing that cue out. There's still, I can see a lot of positives in the, the re everything that I did about that cue and now I'm just gonna do a different cue. And I just, like I said before, like I just got paid to practice and that's cool. Yeah. Um, and just knowing how to take a punch and knowing how to roll with it, you know, it's like knowing how to, you know, it's like knowing how to like, how to, how to maneuver all of the notes and the timing and everything. It's that's stuff that just comes, I think, with experience. And I think, you know, like, I guess I just say this because if sometimes I wish I could kind of take myself aside when I first started and just be like, <laughs> look, man, like, this is normal. Don't, don't give up. Don't quit. Like, just keep powering through it and just f figure out how to just be a little more Zen about it. Mm. Um, you know, like when I talked about people, you know, it was a, known thing to talk Peter off the ledge, you know, like I've, I've like I said, I, last week I talked two of my friends off of a ledge, which was hilarious. So I hope that's not like a offensive term. That may not be a very nice way to put it, but anyway, that's what, that's what we called it. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, it's, it feels absolutely intense when you're in those moments and you just think this is it. Like 
I mean, you know, you're not going to die, but it feels like. Yeah, you feel like if like, I, this one cue, man, it's like, if I don't get this done, my career is over, you know, and this producer's never going to work for me, and then my manager's never going to work for me, and everything's over. You know, it's like, like you just spin out and you have this really messed up, like, it's it's very easy to go down this this really intense hole. Um, and then And then also, you definitely don't want to communicate that with the people you're working right, with. Right, They yeah. don't want to sense yeah. an ounce of... Um, discomfort from you they want you to they want to think you have everything 100 percent under control yeah. all the time yeah so you know even now you know it's like like i like the, the advice i gave my friend i was like you know just and this was advice that i was given i was like go for a run come back have a shower sit down write an email maybe even send it tomorrow right like but and make sure you are not communicating that you're freaking out right now you know what i yeah. mean yeah that's yeah, yeah that's yeah. like a, Give that's it a, a moment you, yeah, like it's it's nice to have someone on the on the post team that you can do that with, you know, like like when I work on ERP, there's not usually a lot of reason for us to to get stressed out on that show, but you know, I work with uh, Rob and his assistant Christian, and we're all really tight. So it's nice that you can call someone and be like, "Oh, this is frustrating," you know. But like if you don't have that person, yeah. It can be a pretty lonely, isolating feeling, you know, when yeah. you're alone, yeah, having a meltdown. So, so yeah, anyway, I think I would just like to, you know, I think it's just worth mentioning to people getting started that it's, this is like a normal thing that you just sort of learn how to deal with. And it does, you get better at it. You do, it's a skill that you get better at. Yeah. I think even just acknowledging that it is extremely hard. I mean, we're put in this almost impossible position in a way to think that there's this like, uh, that the ingredients lists include being a sensitive artist who has empathy and able to relate to a lot of different things, but that also means that you're vulnerable and that, uh, you know, that, Sometimes you wear your emotions on your sleeve or you feel things very intensely. Uh, mm-hmm. You're asked to be so in touch with your inner emotional landscape and creativity that you can generate things out of nothing on a dime, um, on a budget, on, de- mm-hmm. uh, on deadline. And then also be able to completely take the notes and sometimes impossible people and impossible situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also not necessarily get paid enough and worry about, you know, paying rent or mortgage or everything else. And once that gig's done, what's next, maybe nothing. And you also don't have any time or mental real estate to hunt for a new one right now. Totally. And, <laughs> and there's dump- no roadmap for any of this. And then dump like a good pint of imposter syndrome on top of all of that sure. to just yeah. like really glue it all together, you know, and then it <laughs> just, yeah, it just seems like a, like a recipe for total mental failure but well you, you seem like you're doing really well and i mean all of your successes belie that and uh, it's really fun to sort of see you moving through all of these different uh, projects with aplomb um what's what's what are you working on at the moment what's sort of exciting for you uh what can and, you unfortunately i can't i can't talk too much about about the things i'm working on right now that's literally cause... always the most badass thing you can say <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know there's one so I, I am working on i'm working on a, a small animated series right now which has cool. been really really fun it's actually my first um, well, I did some anime, I did do some animation a long time ago, but this is like the first sort of bigger animated, uh, project that I've worked on, which has been so far really, really fun. Uh, it's like, just like, again, a whole other rejigging of your brain. Mm. Um, even before it, I, like, I called up a couple, couple of my friends, you know, uh, Christian Burgi, who's d- done some animation and Neil Parfit, I talked to both of them and just sort of like, just like, you know, give me the lay of the land here. And so they were really helpful before I started it. So that's, that's been a really fun project. Um, and then I also just finished composing a huge library of music for an upcoming cooking show. Mm. Um, uh, actually, I think I can, it's called Mary Makes It Easy, um, which is going to be coming out in the fall. I just don't know when or where, uh, but I know that's already been announced. So actually I, I'm okay talking about that. Um, so those are the two main things. And then um, there's early, I just got my first post schedule for the sixth season of work and moms nice. sitting in my inbox right now. I just haven't had the stomach to look at it just yet, uh, but I'm going to look at that soon. And, uh, and yeah. And yeah, sadly, you know, normally in this in the, uh, around now we'd be working on the new season of Winona Herb, but sadly, I think that show's put to rest, which oh, that's too makes bad. us all very, very sad. Cause that was like a real unicorn of a show. Like, sure. I don't know if a show like that's, ever going to come along again just like mm. a no holds barred anything goes like how much can you freak out the producers you know with your weird crazy music you know competition it was like yeah that's going to be a 
I'm going to miss that show a lot for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, sometimes the fans resurrect and you guys have rabid, absolutely devoted fans. So you Certainly never know. It could, it could see a resurrection of some sort. Yeah. They brought it back once. They got one more season out of it, but I'm, I don't know. I have, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? I really hope, yeah. I really hope that show comes back again because <laughs> it's so fun. It is so well, fun to work on. Fingers crossed for that. But it looks like in the meantime, you've got lots of other great stuff going on. Peter, this has been so much fun. Uh, totally. thanks a lot for spending the time and, uh, for, uh, delving into all the great work and stories you have uh, really enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. It's always My a pleasure. pleasure. All right. Well, you have a re- great rest of the day and enjoy the next, uh, whatever's next for you. Totally. All right. Cheers. Take care. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider showing your support by giving the show a five-star rating and sharing the episodes with your friends and followers. The Screen Composer Studio is produced by myself, Adrian Ellis. Graphics and post-production assistance by Nick Grimshaw. Special thanks to our managing director, Tanya Dedrick, as well as Charlie Finley, Elizabeth Hannon, and Guggen Singh for their support. For more information on the SCGC, please visit www.screencomposers.ca and follow us online at Screen Composers, or reach out at tscs at screencomposers.ca.